organization. Hello, I am Joel Gandara. Thanks for being here. And those who ask questions, thanks for asking them. And those who did not ask questions, hopefully you will develop more questions. Sometimes the hardest part is knowing what questions to ask. The very first time that I got a mentor, I remember I was young and I was a little nervous to go to have lunch with him because I remember thinking, I don't know what to say to him. I don't know what to ask. Uh, and that's okay to say that to that person. It's to say, you know, I really don't know what I don't know. Uh, hopefully you'll help me figure it out. And, you know, conversations happened. And over many years, I got to learn a lot from that person. And it changed my way of thinking. The most important thing was I just got out there and started asking those sorts of questions. All right. So let's, oh, so about me, um, I have owned apparel brands, e-commerce uh, websites, fulfillment center for the e-commerce space. I just recently, if, if you're on my newsletter, you would have seen that. Or if you follow me on social media, I got, uh, I, I was able to exit those businesses. I sold them. So um, I'm now almost unemployed, but it's very nice. I've been working consistently since I was 15. So it's kind of nice to say that I don't really have a too much of a thing anymore. And um, not that I was working many hours in the last uh, few years, but I was worrying about businesses all the time. And I got to get rid of that a little bit. Uh, what I do now on a more regular basis is I coach. I, I coach specifically men and most of those are entrepreneurs. It's an absolute passion of mine. I always uh, thank Sean Thomas for getting me started in the coaching world because I didn't even know really that I could ever become a coach. I didn't, it never dawned on me until he put that seed in my mind, and, and here we are. All right, I want to jump into the questions. Looks like we have a, a decent number of them. First one is from Sam Tran, and his question is regarding network marketing. What would be your opinion about get, about someone getting into network marketing if they're afraid to talk to people? So first off, forget network marketing. Forget whatever else the question is. It's, it's afraid to talk to people. That's a, a skill that has to be developed. I, I don't know too many ways to get through a business or for that matter life successfully if you're afraid to talk to people it's a very natural thing if you told me you're afraid to pet a pit bull or you know as a stranger and you don't know that dog and he's stray or you're afraid to swim with sharks absolutely all of that i could see where the danger is but um you know just afraid to talk to someone what's going to happen so i'd ask myself i'd go through a series of questions what's going to happen if someone you talk to them what are they going to do to you? Are they going to shoot you in the face? Are they going to punch you? Are they going to cut your hand off? None of, none of that's going to happen. So you talk to someone and what? Your heart races? You get a little nervous? Or just call it excited? Um, nothing's going to happen to you. But that's a fear to conquer. I'm big on conquering fears. Uh, I shared recently that my big fear is getting out in the ocean. It's very scary for me. And so what did I do? I put my money where my mouth is and my effort where my mouth is. And I got scuba certified uh, just in the last couple of weeks. It was very scary. I had to tread water for 10 minutes without any buoyancy equipment. I had to um, swim 200 yards without stopping. I'd never done that before. So I had to really challenge myself. And I can tell you on the other side of that is some major growth. And I'm not just saying this for myself. I've coached a lot of people through a lot of fears and anxieties and, and they're much better when they put in the work. So Forget all the other questions. You have a very big thing there to address, Sam, and it's a fear of talking to people. And I get it. Everybody's different. Um, what may make you nervous is, seems like nothing to me and vice versa. Maybe you're a great swimmer and I'm not. So that makes me nervous and it doesn't make you nervous. But it's definitely something to work on. My recommendation is it's not going to cost you anything. Go to like a Toastmasters meeting. They have them all over the country. Every day of the week you can find them and find one that works for you and go hang out there. And maybe in the beginning, you don't talk much, but you just see average people who are not professional speakers go to the front of a room and have to give a two minute speech on a given subject and see how they work through it and see how they evolve. And then start thinking about maybe you going up there one day and giving that two minute speech. You're probably gonna be in front of just like five or six, seven people who are probably all nervous. And something interesting about people when they do things like that and they go up to the front and they talk, they'll tell, they'll say, oh my God, in the middle of their talk, they'll say, I'm so nervous right now. But when you're looking at them, you don't 
they didn't seem nervous. They seem fine. Yeah, I think a lot of it is in our own head. So that's something I would work on so much. Uh, you have an opportunity. Look, you've gotten to where you are in life today with limitations. If you can work on improving those, imagine what you can do going forward the next five years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, there's a great opportunity to work on that. So as far as the question, uh, what would be your opinion about someone getting into network marketing if they're afraid to talk to people? Again, it doesn't matter what that beginning of the question. All I care about there is afraid to talk to people. It'd be a good idea to get in front of people. So whatever it is you want to do, if it makes you get in front of people and start talking to them, absolutely do it. But look, you get good at what you practice. If you're practicing being a hermit crab sitting inside of your house and not talking to people and just using a keyboard, you're going to get good at that, which then means you're not practicing talking to people. So get in front of people, talk to the checkout person at the grocery store, talk to the bagger, say, hey, how you doing today? Uh, you know, have these little conversations. It builds the confidence and pretty soon you start realizing, oh, people have their own issues. They're not worrying about whether you look nervous or not. They're just worried about getting through their day. Uh, and after you realize that after a little while, you'll get better at it. Next question is from Lawrence Orbeck. Question is, does having a business that is operated from home that requires customers to come to the home negatively affect the business's perceived credibility? If so, how can these, this be mitigated? I am primarily a service-based business that operates from a private home. My business requires customers to come to me for the service that I offer, either by shipping the item for service or dropping off locally. This question does not apply to customers that ship in, but does for in-person customers. You know, Lawrence, the good thing is that ever since COVID happened, people work from home. It's such a normal thing now that it's just standard. When I was a kid, and I think I'm much old, I, I know because I've spoken to you, I spoke to you yesterday, I'm much older than you. And when I was young, that was weird. If your office or your business was based out of your home, it was kind of odd. Like, what, what's wrong with that person? Why can't they afford to have a location? But in today's reality, it's normal to have it at home. So who cares? Um, and, and if you're getting the customer and they're bringing you the product and they're going to your home, um, who cares what the perceived value? Your work should be so good in your service industry that that's all that matters. So don't block yourself by thinking about how people can see things negative. Just go, just go and do the work and get your customers to come in. Um, tell them, you know, I can keep the cost down because I operate from home. Maybe that is a, is a good argument. If you think that people are going to see you as less, you know, it, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, if you had to rent a warehouse to put your machinery to do your engraving, that's going to cost more. And then you have to have internet there and phone and an alarm and, and electricity and all these expenses that you already have at home. So why add to them? Uh, but I think if you get in your head about, oh, I don't know, I, I think I'm, I'm not looking good, you're going to limit yourself. So don't worry about that. Just do good work get customers, get them to come out to your house. And, and if you grow this business, it's going to be way beyond your house. I mean, the local community, most 99% of the people should be shipping the stuff in because that means you've grown. Your area probably accounts for 1% of the population in the U.S., let's call it. So there's 99% out there that are never going to even know if it's your house or not or care. So just get after it that way. All right. Thank you, Lawrence. Next question is from Mike. Uh, it could either be Ahana or Ajana, A-J-A-N-A. -A -A. I was wondering if you have any sales and marketing ideas for a local moving company. I own a local moving company similar to two men in a truck. Doing about 500000 in annual sales. I can grow my labor team and now want to scale new clients. Have you heard of any ideas I could use to grow new business? That's a tough one, Mike, because, um, yeah, there's probably a billion ideas. Uh, let's see. It would help to know what you're doing currently because maybe I'm just going to repeat some of the ideas that pop to mind and this is just literally right now popping in my mind. Uh, number one, I would have a mentor in your industry. I would go contact all the people on LinkedIn that are in your industry or who ideally have retired. Imagine a retired guy who ran a moving company uh, or sold his moving company and you form a relationship with that person and and take it to lunch every once in a while, or if he's away in a different city, uh, send him a Starbucks card uh, and then have a 15-minute conversation from him with him and, and learn as much as you can. 
And, and a lot of times the form, and by the way, if you think that's impossible, how are you going to get these people? I've done it with names that you've heard of, big name people, and I've gotten in touch with them. And I have them on my phone and I can call a lot of people that I've gotten to meet that in the old times when I thought small, I thought there's no way I could ever talk to the CEO of that massive company. And I could call him on his cell phone now. And I have that with multiple people just because I reached out because I gave it a shot. And I, I improved my sales pitch each time. Um, to get them to talk to me. That's all I was trying to sell them on. Just can we have a 15 minute conversation? So those type of guys will give you some great numbers. They'll say, yeah, this works 72.5% of the time because here's how we implement it. Here's how we did it. So they're right there. You're hitting a home run from day one, contacting the right people. Other than that, I'd look for what other companies are doing. How are they taking business from you, right? What's keeping you from being a two men in a truck? Uh, how do they advertise? Look at what that does. Now, you are going to set yourself apart. You're not going to say we're the biggest. You're going to say we're small, but we care. You know, you're going to go with that approach. Um, maybe you get in touch other than just inbound calls because you do Google ads uh, or, or signs that you put in neighborhoods. Um, maybe you do some deals with a moving, uh, with a company, I don't know, like a a U-Haul place that sells uh, boxes and tape, and maybe the person's not renting their own truck, but they are buying boxes and tape and other things, and 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 you work out a deal where any client they send you, you give them a percentage, you know, things like that. So you form partnerships. So people are out there trying to help you grow because it's in their best interest to do that. Once you do that enough, you start building a name, and you start building a presence, and people will use you again the second time. They'll recommend you a third time, things like that. Another one is, I've coached a young man, very young. He was still in high school, but he was doing phenomenally well and with multiple companies. And he was doing like $8,000 a month in high school. He had a great relationship with his teachers and they knew when his phone rang, he had to step outside of the class. This is not something I read in a book. This is someone I coached. The kid was doing 100 grand a year in high school, 17 years old, just working so well. And I still see signs of his for different businesses that he has around town. So he'll put a... If you're moving, he has a moving and hauling business, so he'll put a signs, hey, moving, call here. Uh, he goes to Facebook groups in our local community, and he says, here's who I am. I offer this service, and all the people who are loyal customers of his, like I've been, uh, will comment, hey, he's a great kid. You should hire him, and he has this group of people that just want to help him succeed because he's done so well with them. So you've got customers. You've done 500000 a year in annual sales. I'd go to those customers and say, hey, we're trying to grow. We have the team. We have the equipment. We have the trucks. Um, just want to see if you can help us grow. If, you, you, if you're happy with our service and you could recommend us, uh, it would mean a lot to us. You know, we, we want to take care of your friends and family the way we took care of you. I think that's a good approach. And if you add up all those things and do what works, right? You have to try these things. Maybe you've tried them all. Okay, go try new things. And whatever works, keep doing more of it. All right, Mike, hope that helps you. Another question from Sam Trand. Uh, let's see. What has helped you build self-confidence? I am introverted and have self-confidence issues and want to change that. Do you have any lessons to share that can help me? So Sam, good observation on your part. I'm glad you're aware of this. You know, the lack of self-confidence, the introverted nature of you just being that way. And there's nothing wrong with being an introvert. I personally am an introvert. I have some extrovert uh, qualities, but um, for the most part, I am definitely an introvert. I like being alone. I have no problem with it. Um, I get burned out a little bit in big groups for too long. That tires me out. Coincidentally, I have a meet and greet for a congressman or someone running for Congress today at my house where I invited a lot of people and he's going to be coming to speak at my house. And um, that's okay for a little while, two hours, and then people start going home. Perfect. Uh, if I have to be there doing a lot for too many hours with too many people, it, it really burns me out, tires me out, drains my energy. So look, nothing wrong. A lot of successful introverts. In fact, there's a book I'll recommend. It's called uh, The Introvert Edge. Introverts can do phenomenally well if they get good at implementing systems to do things and they can out hustle extroverts a lot of the time, even in sales and anything. Sales is a in, in extroverts game. Not all the time. A lot of time introverts can actually beat them when they implement the things in that book. It's not a book that I wrote, so I'm not trying to sell you a book. Um, introverts Edge, it's called. So let's see. Building self-confidence. What could you do? Again, you know, these mentor sessions... 
I really wish they were live with you guys in front of us because then I would ask you, I would drill you with questions. To me, giving uh, uh, any type of advice is normally about questions, and that leads to sometimes a solution. But are you taking care of yourself physically? Well, see, self confidence, eat very healthy, don't eat processed food, don't eat bread, sugar, uh, junk, fast food, don't eat any of that. You're going to start feeling different. Do push ups every day. Do sit-ups, uh, go to the gym, um, do pull-ups. You do these sort of things, your body starts feeling different. You start looking different. And talk about self-confidence, you start seeing that, man, the things I control, some things you can't control. If you say, well, I'm not six foot tall and I want to be six foot, you can't control that. Don't worry about it. The things that you can control, I, you're making them better by working out, by eating healthy, by doing all the right things. That builds self-confidence in itself. I tell you this because... I coach men and I and I hear these things sometimes. And, and by the way, I coach some very confident, extremely successful, multi-million dollar a year earners. And 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 still they have space to work and improve. So don't think, oh well, I'm at the very bottom. I have to work. Everybody's got something somewhere at whatever stage you're at. So don't worry about that. There's always somebody who has it worse than you. There's always gonna be people that have it better than you. Don't worry about everybody else. Worry about yourself. What you can control is the way you feel. So look for small victories. Set some goals for yourself. So for example, um, in a previous question, Sam, you talked about being nervous and scared of talking to people. All right, you wanna build that confidence? Who are you not scared to talk to? Are you not scared to talk to an unattractive woman? And I say that because a lot of guys are scared and intimidated to talk to a beautiful woman. Okay, fine. You don't have to jump off the deep end and go talk to the most beautiful woman you can find. Go find the least attractive woman you can find and go talk to her. Or maybe it's an old man. Go talk to an old man and go have a, a 10 second conversation. You see him sitting on a park bench. You go, hey, how you doing today, sir? And you sit next to him and just have a little chat. And then you go, oh, that wasn't so bad. That builds your confidence a little bit. You know, I had a high school teacher in, in biology who was also my baseball coach, uh, Mr. Goulding. And I liked what he said once. He said, success breeds success. So you have to have small victories under your belt. And I mean small. If you can't do 10 straight push-ups, as an example, work on it for two weeks and get yourself to 10 straight push-ups. And pretty soon you look at your paper and you say, well, uh, last Monday I only got to four. The next day I got to five. The next day six. And hey, I hit it. I did 10. That's a victory right there. And that's what you need, Sam. You need to start collecting victories because each one of them makes you a little bit more self-confident and each one leads to bigger things. So you might say, well, 10 push-ups, that's not a big deal. That's fine. Let's start small and then from there build on it and do bigger and bigger things. I'm telling you, this stuff works. All right. Interestingly enough, Sam, your email is... Uh, and written a spell, you know, phonetically, because there's numbers in there, but great coach Sam T. So I'm assuming you're some sort of coach and you put the word great in your email. So you probably don't have as bad a self confidence issues if you put the word great. Uh, hopefully, that's a little tiny thing that helps you realize, okay, I'm not so bad. I called myself great. Uh, here's another question from Sam Tran How do you think? Oh, sorry. What do you think about trying network marketing for a first business opportunity? I have a job at my family's grocery store and I want to branch out and try to start doing my own thing. I was thinking about network marketing. What things should I consider when deciding whether this would be a good option? And if I do choose, what are the key things I can do to increase my chances of success? So Sam, I personally, just me, don't kill me everybody, I don't know anybody who's made money doing network marketing. That's just me. I'm one of those who tried when I was like 18 years old. And the only reason I did it is because my friend said, if you don't make any money, I'll give you back the $200 you invested to be in this thing. Um, so network marketing uh, is, is great for the people in general who invent the thing because then they're going to get a piece of everything you do. You got to buy products, you buy it from them. They always make money. So I like being on that side. I like being that guy who invents that thing, although I've never invented a network marketing business. You could do that. You could try it. There will definitely be lessons. And I think the reason that most people don't do well in it is because they give up. And I think that's the reason most people don't do well at everything in life is that they give it a half effort 
They try it for a week or two. Oh, by the way, they get motivated because they go to the big pitch meeting and they get them all excited and they tell them, look what I made last month. Ah, and everybody cheers. And then they go, and then they go home. And then they got to make that phone call. And then they got to email people. And then they got to take a phone call. They got to explain. They got to work. And nobody likes that part. Everybody likes celebrating. Look at the check that I got last month. Whether that's true or not, I don't know if all those network marketing are being honest about what they earn. But it's not about the fame and the, the popularity and the, wow, you go to the front and everybody cheers that you made X amount of dollars. That, that part doesn't last. Even that guy who's a top seller and he made $100,000 last month and he gets celebrated at the front of the meeting and, and he shows a check and everybody cheers. He's up there for one minute and that's it. But nobody sees the 16 hours a day that that guy had to be on the phone. And he had to go talk to people and meet with them and show them the thing and get rejections and lose friendships and lose a girlfriend and lose all of that because he had to work that hard, right? And to have more money to, because when you're growing a business, cash flow suffers. So he didn't go out to dinner. He didn't go to the movies. He didn't hang out with his friends. He had to keep reinvesting. Does that sound like I'm saying it pretty personal, right? That was me. I had to do that. Sean probably had to do that. A lot of guys. <laughs> And girls who have had very good success have had to suffer through that. So I just want you to not get drawn in by the smoke and mirrors and excitement of you're going to make millions. Yeah, you can make millions for sure, but you got to kick you got to kick your own butt. You got to work so hard to do these things. Nothing's easy. Look, if it was easy, everybody would do it. And imagine if everybody would do it, then you're not going to make much money because it's too much competition. You got to do the things that are hard that a lot of people don't want to do and you got to bust your butt. You know, if the entry fee to do this is 500 bucks and you're willing to lose that to learn some lessons, go ahead and do it. But whether it's this or anything else, Sam, you're going to bust your butt. You got to work hard. You say your parents have a grocery store. Ask your dad and mom if they're the ones who founded that, how that was. Maybe now they're comfortable and they're doing well, but ask them about those first years, what that was like, you know, when they had to worry about not having enough money to buy food and things like that. Um, that's what starting a business is all about. You gotta have thick skin. Sometimes I've heard this said and I've thought it too. When I've been in the thick of the bad times in my business where I went months without paying myself so I can pay the employees and I was taking a bag of lunch to work and they're going out to eat and, and I was nervous about what's gonna happen. I didn't know that turning a corner the next month I was gonna net $200,000. Know, I didn't know that I just kept working really hard. Uh, those moments, I would say, man, if I knew this, I wouldn't have started the business. But I'm glad I did because I got through those humps and they were way better on the other side. So, all right, next question is from Ricardo Delgado. I see you guys comment on the, uh, on the side here. It's hard to keep up because I, I got a Google Docs open with the questions and then I see um, your comments. I wish I could do both at the same time. All right, let's see. Ricardo Delgado, premium barber. What things do I need to get in place if I plan to sell my company? I own a barber shop and I'm interested in learning more of what is necessary to exit this business. What type of things are involved when doing this? Thanks in advance. Ricardo, number one, I would have a game plan for what you're going to do after. Don't sell your business and just say, well, I got a, some money now in the bank and I'll figure it out. No, I would have that game plan and I would start dabbling in that and I would start testing that business or industry or job or whatever it is. I would start working on that. As far as what you should do to make sure the business, okay, so you're a barbershop. I don't have particular barbershop experience. So I've bought 14 companies. I've never bought a barbershop, so I don't know anything about that. Um, but you want to make the business look and, and not just look, be uh, functioning in a way that a new owner could just step right in and take it over and it's attractive. So what does that mean? The customers check in, you know, their appointment was set hopefully through an app. That would be amazing because if I come in as an owner and I'm not a barber, because um, by the way, you want to be able to open this business up to who anybody would want to buy it because it's so well run. I think that's important. So let's say there's an app to set appointments. Not that you have to do that. I'm just saying what looks really attractive. It's hands off. You see the barber schedule. You click it. You're on. They don't have to call back and forth. Well, how about 2 o'clock? No, it doesn't work for me. How about 3 o'clock? I always saw that in barber shops and said, why hasn't anybody disrupted this? Maybe some do already. But for the most part, it's such an antiquated run business where a person's on a phone for four minutes to make an appointment when it could just be an app. And they see the schedule. They see the barber they want. They click it. Submit. Done. Uh, that would be a lot better. So anyway, if somebody ran a business like that, I would be more interested in buying it personally because 
it's hands off. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, that's just one example. Um, you want barbers to be happy and treating customers well, and that usually reflects on Google reviews and Yelp. You got to make sure, again, this isn't, or, or, or just to be clear, this isn't something you take care of today to sell it next month. This is something I hope that you, you've been taking care of. When a, a customer is there, you say, hey, before you go, could you, or while you're getting your haircut, could you give us a, a good review on, on Google and Yelp or whatever is meaningful to you, whichever one of those, or there's others maybe. I would start building that up because think about it. If you're the buyer of that business, you're scared. You're thinking, I'm going to give him all this money. I got to make sure he's running it well. Wow, look at all the reviews. He's got a 4.8 and everybody's just saying, love my barbershop, love this, love that. And the other thing is, unless you're going to stay on board, Ricardo, you don't want those comments to be about you. Because if you're leaving, then they, people are going to say, wow, they just like Ricardo. This has got to be in general about the barbershop or about the other barbers, not about you. Nobody wants to buy a business that's about you because the day you leave, that business is not as valuable. So uh, also, I understand that's a cash business, so it could be a little bit different. Uh, but having clean books, you know, I've bought businesses and I have to see that the P&L makes sense, the balance sheet makes sense, um, the bank account, it's all got to match. Uh, a, a smart buyer will review everything. They're going to ask you for your balance sheet at certain dates and then they're going to ask you like a, like last month, where was your balance sheet at? Although I understand a barbershop, there's not a lot of assets on a balance sheet. It's a, it's a simpler business. You don't have a ton of inventory, nothing like that. So that's better. That's good. Simple. But your P&L, your profit and loss statement has to make sense. You know, you can't have these massive months and then little months. You got to either be steady or slight growth over time. That's fantastic. But then they're going to verify that. They're going to want to see your bank account. They may even want to see your taxes to make sure that the things that you're putting on that make sense. And then they're going to pay you based on that, maybe on that profitability. So clean books is are very important. That goes for everybody in every industry. If you ever want to sell your business or for yourself to make good decisions in business, you got to have good data. Otherwise you're not, you're just guessing at things. All right. Another question from Ricardo Delgado. How do you create a business partnership? I want to know how to structure a business partnership. What type of legal advice should I look for when doing this? Or is it based on a handshake or relationship? Any mentors with experience, I appreciate any feedback. Thank you. All right, Ricardo, I am, I have been, and I am still in multiple partnership businesses. Um, never on a handshake and never on just the relationship. I believe in relationships and they're important. And I have great relationships with my business partners. Those are operators. I'm an investor. I'm just sitting back, but I have to trust them and they have to trust me, although I don't have much of a, a thing to do there other than I put the money up. Uh, but it all has to be in the shareholder agreement. Look, if you don't have a shareholder, you're going to hear this all the time. And then you're not you, but a lot of entrepreneurs avoid this and they ignore this advice. And then they come back to me or to Sean or whoever and they say, I should have listened. I should have had a shareholder agreement. I hear this couple times a year. Like, yeah, I messed up. And, and sometimes I hear from extremely successful entrepreneurs who should know a lot better, a lot more. And they just say, yeah, I messed up. I, I, we were so excited about moving forward. We just started. Well, I won't start a partnership. I won't do that first transaction without a shareholder agreement. For me, I just call my attorney and say, hey, uh, that questionnaire, my partner and my potential partner and I already filled it out. Here it is. And that questionnaire I got from my attorney years ago when we formed the first partnership. And it's a series of questions. And it's, how do we know when to pull out money from the business? When we both vote on it, for example, or two out of three of us vote that we're gonna draw money out. And what's the formula for drawing money out? Okay, well, we will, and it, it's all there. So if you wanna take money out of that partnership and your partner says, no, 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 we have to leave it in the business, you're gonna fight about that. Well, we don't have fights because it's all in there. If you're gonna play a baseball game, you're just gonna go figure it out or, or there's a rule book. You know where the ball goes over the plate, home plate between your knees and the letters of your chest or your waist, wherever, that's a strike. What do you, you're gonna argue that when, it's, when the ball gets thrown and emotions are high and money's on the line? No, that's the rule. Hey, the ball went over the plate at the knees, that's a strike. There's nothing to talk about. Um, I find this just to be like parenthood, a partnership. I can see a, a similarity. I could have rules in my house with my kids. And when that happens, I don't have to get upset. I don't have to yell. I could say, oh, hey, uh, you didn't do the dishes last night. That's your job. Uh, you're not going out for the rest of the week. Boom. And I walk away and there's no problem. I don't have to yell. I don't have to get upset. Tensions don't get high. Same thing in a partnership. 
that partner needs to make sure that the profit and loss statements are finished every week, uh, every month by the 10th. That's his job. Well, maybe that he's not an accountant, he's not a bookkeeper, but he has to oversee the bookkeeper that does that. Well, that's his responsibility to come back and report to you, hey, here are the financials are done on time. Oh, you know what? They're not going to be done on time. I'm on the bookkeeper. I'm, I'm bugging her about it to get it done, but it hasn't been done yet. But we're working on it. Otherwise, what? You're just going to figure it out as it comes. Go, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I messed up. And then you're accepting that subpar performance. Have a shareholder agreement in place. It's not a handshake. It's not a relationship thing. It, you should have a good relationship and then put it in writing because people tend to forget when money's on the line. Last question is from Robin Turpin. Robin is an artist. All right. Do you think it is a good idea to offer original, one-of-a-kind, tiny art? This is two inches by three inches, so very tiny art. All right. Uh, I am working on a collection of two inch by three inch tiny colored pencil drawings. They take 10 hours. I charge $50 in a plexiglass frame. I'm willing to get paid $5 per hour to get my brand out there. What do you think? Thank you. All right, Robin, that's a tough one. You know, I do believe in investing and not making money on some transactions if that gives you growth. So if you're willing to do it and you're willing to test it out, the good thing is you don't have to make 10,000 of them because that would be a lot of hours because it sounds like it's going to take you a while to do these. Um, so you can try a few, make a collection. What's the worst thing that could happen? You just get those $50 and you sold them for cheap, but maybe you get your name out there. It's almost like a little business card for you to put that out there. Um, worth a shot. Uh, why not? You know, there, so art is difficult. And the reason you have so many starving artists, I think, is because it's a, it's a beautiful craft. You're doing something that takes, you know, it lets you express yourself and you're hoping you find people that will appreciate it. The problem is, and artists I'm sure complain about this all the time, is that people aren't valuing the work and the art and all of that things. I'm very ignorant when it comes to art. I just don't see it. I don't have an artistic mind. I just have logical thinking. So I'm the opposite. I can't draw a stick figure, uh, barely. And so I'm, I'm one of those out there that just doesn't appreciate it. I wish my mind worked that way, but it doesn't. But you know, when I hear $50 for this tiny little thing, for me, I don't know that it's worth it without seeing it. But how could it be worth it? What if that tiny little thing was $20? Now, you're not going to work for $2 an hour. And I'm not saying to go sell out on your art. But as a business person, I see that as make, being made overseas, not by me, by an artist that works for me, who will do it for $2 an hour. And then I could bring it here and sell it for $50, right? It may have cost me 20 and now I can make some money. So the, the problem is you have to realize, what do you want to do? Do you want to be the artist that does all her own work? Or do you want to be an artist who oversees other artists, gives them an opportunity to make some money, and can grow this thing at a faster rate uh, without having to do all the work? So I have a friend. She's got a massive art company. Um, I don't know that she does any of the art. Her and her sister run this company. And I mean, it's a, it's a massive. You, you know who they are. They're in... Uh, major stores are all over the country. They sell all over the world. Um, they have artists who do all these things and they're all overseas primarily. And, and this is how they've grown to be such a massive company. That's one extreme. That's one way to do it. If you want to just keep doing everything yourself, then I'd say, yeah, try this thing, you know, but it, it's a lot of work, uh, 10 hours to make an item that you're going to sell for $50 and there's supply costs in there. There's that plexiglass frame, you're not making that much. You're probably going to make four or something an hour. So I don't think you want to get locked into doing this forever unless you see that, man, every time I do one of these and I sell 20 of them, they come back and buy a big piece from me. That might be worth it, right? Depending on what your price is for that. So art is a delicate balance between get your art out there, stay real to your craft, but you got to make money. So that's a dilemma that I always find with art. Again, without being someone who knows much about art. All right, Robin, I wish you the best with that. I look forward to hearing on Facebook uh, how that goes for you. All right, everybody, thank you for joining me again. I'm Joel Gandara. It's always a pleasure to be here with you guys and to see what you're thinking and hopefully provide some guidance. Like I always say, it's, it's very difficult being one-sided. I hear a question and I have to come up with an answer in the moment. A um, little difficult because I usually, there's more to it. I want to ask a thousand more questions. So one recommendation I would make when you ask these questions, just get a little more detailed. It doesn't have to be a big, long paragraph, but say, 
I'm trying to grow this business. Here's what I've been doing, but I'm having issues with these. What do you suggest about this? Because that's where my questions would have led to. All right, everybody. Thank you. Have a fantastic day.